Good afternoon class. Today we will be discussing the central nervous system and I hope a lot of this material is a review because we have already talked about the central nervous system in lab. Alright, so as you know the central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord and we will be spending a lot of time the majority of the time discussing the brain. All right, and there are different regions of the brain that have different functions that we will be discussing. The cerebral hemispheres, diencephalon, brainstem, and cerebellum. And with the cerebral hemisphere, we'll talk about the different lobes. Diencephalon, we'll talk about the different parts that make up the diencephalon. We'll talk about the parts that make up the brainstem, and then we'll talk about the cerebellum also. Okay, so here is a diagram that's just showing you the cerebral hemisphere. Um, it's just uh, showing you where the diencephalon is located. And the diencephalon composed of um, several different parts. You have the subthalamus, epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. What usually gets the most attention or what usually you hear most about is the hypothalamus. Um, because the hypothalamus works with the pituitary gland um, to help regulate the endocrine system. Okay, and your endocrine system, um, those are glands that are responsible for, you know, your metabolism, your body temperature, things of that nature. Um, and two of the major endocrine glands are your thyroid gland and adrenal cortex um, gland. But again, we will talk about you know, diencephalon in more detail, but the thalam the hypothalamus gets a lot of attention um, just because it works with the pituitary gland to help regulate the endocrine um, system, which is very important. And then the cerebellum, okay, we'll talk about the cerebellum, what it does, and then the brain stem, which is composed of the midbrain, um, the pons, and the medulla. Okay, so we'll talk about the function of the brain stem has important functions too. Okay, we'll talk about that also. All right, so your cerebral hemispheres. Um, so you have a, a right and a left. Um, you can break it up into a right and left parts of the brain. Um, so you have what's called ridges and grooves. Okay, so. The ridges are called gyri and the grooves are called sulci. And you'll see on the next slide in this image um, how you have all these um, ridges and you see the grooves. And this is also in this diagram. It shows you the gyrus, the ridges, and then the sulcus, um, the grooves. Okay. A fissure is just a deeper groove. That's all a fissure is. That's a deep sulcus. Okay. It's just a deeper groove. And essentially, um, they use these um, sulcus to divide the brain up into lobes, okay? So you have a lot of um, sulcus, and sometimes they use fissures too, all right? Sulcus and fissures to divide the brain into, into lobes, okay? So you have this central sulcus. You see this central sulcus, all right? Um, that's a, a main sulcus that's used to separate the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Okay, that's central sulcus. Then you have this lateral sulcus right here. Okay, that's another sulcus that's used to divide the brain up into lobes. All right, that's going to separate your frontal lobe from your temporal lobe. Okay. All right, and then you have your occipital lobe. They don't have the, you have this parietal occipital sulcus right here. Okay, it's separate the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. Okay, and essentially we're going to talk about it in more detail. Um, each of your lobes have different functions. And again, a lot of the ways that they learned about your brain, as far as the functions of the different structures, um, or essentially accidents where people got in bad accidents 
and different parts of the brain got damaged. And also when people have strokes, um, when people have strokes, certain parts of the brain can be affected depending on what area of the brain the stroke affected. Okay. And by um, people having strokes and they see how it affects their facial muscles, they see how it affects certain sides of their body can move while the other side is paralyzed. Things of that nature, they've learned also from that also different functions of the brain. All right. And um, also just be aware, anything that's in red and circled, all right, you should definitely know. And I'm not saying the other things aren't important, but anything you see circled in red, all right, you should definitely know. Because a lot of these figures are going to have a lot of things going on. So look for things that are circled, okay? All right, so the lobes of the cerebrum are going to be the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. And we're going to go in more detail about each of the lobes. And you will learn that the lobes have different functions, okay? Um, different things take place in different lobes. So we're going to go into that in more detail. But what, what they have on this diagram circled is the central sulcus. Again, it's going to separate the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And then you have the, they have the, right here the transverse cerebral fissure, okay? Right here, transverse cerebral fissure separates the cerebrum from the cere cerebellum, okay? Transverse fissure separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Here's a diagram just showing you the different lobes. Again, the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, okay? And then you can see the cerebellum and right there, the brainstem. All right, so far as gray matter and the white matter of the brain goes um, for layers of the cerebrum. So gray matter is going to be composed of mostly neuron cell bodies, okay? Your gray matter is going to be made of mostly the neuron cell bodies, whereas the white matter is going to be the axon tracks, okay? So remember, so remember with a neuron, you have the cell body, we have the dendrites with the information coming in, then the cell body, then you have the axon that's leaving, the inf taking the information out away from the neuron. So essentially, the white matter, it's going to be white due to the myelin sheath that's going to be covering the axon. So remember, the axons have that myelin sheath that's covering them, um, it's insulating them, and it's going to help um, propagate the actual potential down the axon okay so that's why the axon tracks are white is due to the myelin sheath that's covering them okay so gray matter it's going to be the neuron cell bodies white matter the axon track the corpus callosum is what's going to connect the left side of the left hemisphere of the brain to the right hemisphere of the brain so that's obviously very important that's how both sides of the brain communicate w with each other. Corpus callosum. You're gonna hear that word a lot. You should understand what that what that is and where it's located. And then you also will hear the term basal nuclei a lot. So um, basal nuclei are islands of gray matter buried within the white matter. Okay. So just understand that ba basal nuclei or just um, islands of gray matter is gonna be buried within white matter. All right, so this is showing you a transverse cut of the brain. So this is a transverse cut of the brain. And remember, there's a lot of things going on in this picture, but um, look for what's circled in red, okay? You have here the corpus callosum. And um, just understand, uh, 
our, our commissure um, our commissure is just a meeting place um, so right here you have this arrow going to this commissure so a commissure is just a meeting place of uh, two bodies so that's just where the right and the left hemispheres are, are meeting this commissure um, but this is your corpus callosum okay that's where the right and the left hemispheres com um, communicate with with each other and then here go some basal nuclei okay so you remember basal nuclei is gray matter buried within white matter so you see right here all right this is your basal nuclei which is gray matter which is cell bodies essentially buried within the white matter okay which are the axon tracks and the corpus callosum is just really one big axon track okay um, it's one big axon track allowing the right and left hemisphere to communicate with each other um, you can also see the thalamus we'll, we will talk about the um, thalamus more when we talk about the when we talk about the diencephalon but you see the thalamus, thalamus here um, a ventricle is just a space so third ventricle it's just a space where the cerebral spinal fluid is going to be flowing okay you see that third ventricle lateral lateral ventricle okay again that's a space where the um, cerebral spinal fluid will be flowing you see the pons right here you see underneath the pons the medulla all right and this of course is this um, cerebellum right here and let's see okay so that was the main structures on this figure but again pay special attention to what's circled okay circled in red pay special attention to what's circled on the figures all right so again you have specialized areas of the cerebrum so again um, through accidents through strokes things of that nature they learned what different parts of the brain do okay so you have a primary somatic sensory area okay that's going to be your parietal lobe so your parietal lobe is going to be um, responsible for taking in sensory information okay your sensory receptors are going to send their information to the parietal lobe and the parietal lobe is going to decide what to do with that sensory information okay pride that's a parietal lobe the primary motor area okay which is going to send impulses to the skeletal muscles all right um, this is going to be located in the frontal lobe that's going to be your primary motor area and then you have the broca area okay which is in, in, involved in our ability to speak and the broca area is also going to be found in our frontal lobe and we'll see that in the diagram on the next slide all right so you see right here um, look for your sulcus which you know divides your lobes your cerebrum into different lobes so remember the central sulcus divides the um, frontal lobe from the parietal lobe and you see right here frontal lobe primary motor area that's in your frontal lobe and you see this is circled here your broca area motor speech that's in your frontal lobe and then your primary somatic sensory area you see right here this is in your parietal lobe okay and we're going to talk about the occipital lobe later but you see it here already the occipital lobe it deals with visual um, area and then your temporal lobe is going to deal with the auditory okay we're hearing auditory and this is that lateral sulcus okay remember that lateral sulcus is going to be separating the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe okay so that's where you have your auditory area and that temporal lobe okay you see another um, this dotted outline right here okay this dotted outline right here which the line points to speech and language 
Um, that also is referred to as Wernicke's area, okay? And it's involved in the comprehension of written, written and spoken language, okay? And then you have Broca area, which is also involved with speech, but it deals with the motor aspect of speech, okay? Um, whereas Wernicke area deals with comprehension. Essentially, when you damage the Wernicke area, um, the person can will be able to speak, but what they're saying won't make any sense, essentially. Okay, if you damage the Broca area, then they're going to not be able to um, create speech because that motor area has been damaged, so they won't be able to to uh, create speech. But with Wernicke area, this area, if it gets damaged, they'll still be able to talk because the Broca area is still okay. So they can still create speech, um, but it's just not going to make any sense. Okay, um, so Broca area and Wernicke this area is they're they're connected they have to work together in order to come up with fluent um, comprehensible speech all right so then um, again you have also um, regions of the cerebral cerebral um, part of the brain that are involved with special senses okay so you have taste vision auditory which is hearing olfactory which is smelling and the next figure I believe is going to well one of the yeah the um, figure after that will tell will show you those areas and then you have areas of the cerebrum where you interpret things like speech language language comprehension um, and then just gen general um, interpretation areas. So you have different areas that interprets the sensory information that's coming in. Okay. All right. So language comprehension. You see that right here. Your frontal lobe. That's in the frontal lobe. Okay. Broca's area. We already talked about motor speech. Um, that's also in the frontal lobe. The olfactory area, okay, this is in your temporal lobe. Um, auditory area, also in your temporal lobe, okay. Visual area, occipital lobe. Um, speech language, um, again, this dash line usually referred to Wernicke's area right there. And then taste right here, all right. You see the taste right there. So you see with the with the taste um, area, you see this is central sulcus. Remember the central sulcus divides the um, frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And if you follow that down, you see that this taste area still falls within the parietal lobe. Okay, but it's real close to that central sulcus. All right, so they also have kind of figured out what your left and right hemispheres um, are responsible for. So in general, the left hemisphere controls language, math, and logic. And understand that um, if you're right-handed, then you are left hemisphere dominant, okay? Um, the way things cross over, um, and you will also see that with a stroke. A person who have a stroke on like the left side of their brain, okay, um, then their paralysis is usually on the right side of their body. But far as right-handed people, they are generally left hemisphere dominant. So, and again, this is a generalization, also pretty much a stereotype. It doesn't mean you're good at math and language, but um, the areas that the left hemisphere um, controls are language, math, and logic. Okay, and then right hemisphere. So, um, and again, this is a, a, a generalization. It is not always the case, but a person who's left-handed will generally be. That means that their right hemisphere 
is more dominant, okay? All right, the right hemisphere would be more dominant. And then right hemisphere is involved with things with, um, think, think of more your arts related things, your art skills, intuition, um, visual spatial skills, insight. Okay, that's more where you find your right hemisphere. That's what you find in that side of the brain. And again, the left and right hemisphere communicate via um, the corpus callosum, okay, which are fiber tracts in the cerebral white matter. Again, the corpus callosum is those um, axon tracts, okay, connects the right and left hemisphere. Okay, so the diencephalon. So um, your diencephalon is made up of the thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus. Um, so it sits on top of the brain stem, okay, and it's enclosed by the cerebral hemispheres. And essentially, um, the thalamus is really important in relaying sensory information, okay? And hy hypothalamus is really important when it comes to... Um, relating information and, and 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 also coordinating with the pituitary gland relating information um, and affecting the endocrine system working together with the endocrine system okay so you hear that with the hypothalamus okay so again this is the cerebral hemisphere you see the diencephalon okay all right, which is sitting on top of the brain stem, okay? And remember, the brain stem consists of the midbrain, pons, and medulla, okay? But you don't see the different, you know, we're going to go in another um, diagram where you can see the different parts of the diencephalon better. Okay, all right, so remember things that are circled because there's a lot going on in here um so you have your hypothalamus which is circled right here all right so again your hypothalamus is going to be important hypothalamus along with the pituitary gland which is right here okay uh, hypothalamus and pituitary gland they interact with the endocrine system so they're important for um, interacting with the endocrine system and again your endocrine systems um, is very very important um, so I mean body temperature um, all your different hormones that affect different things okay those all deal with the endocrine system all right so very important all right and then you have your thalamus right here which is right there and again your thalamus is a, a very important um it relays sensory information okay so sensory information that comes from the you know spinal cord up through the brain stem goes to the thalamus and then from the thalamus it's going to relay it to different parts of the cerebrum okay so the thalamus is going to relay that sensory information to different parts of the cerebrum um and then the pineal gland which is part of the epithalamus so pineal gland which is right here Okay, part of the epithalamus, all right? And those are what's circled on this diagram. So the um, pineal gland, its function isn't totally understood, but it does produce melatonin, okay? So I'm sure they even sell, I think, melatonin now at nutrition stores. But essentially, it's going to, melatonin is going to help with regulating sleep patterns, okay? So that is one thing they know that the pineal gland um, does, but its function isn't totally understood. All right, so the thalamus surrounds the third ventricle. It's the relay station for sensory impulses. So it's gonna transfer impulses to the correct part of the um, cortex for localization and interpretation all right so again like i said before information comes up from the spinal cord sensory information comes from the spinal cord through you know through the brain stem up to the um 
thalamus, and then from the thalamus, it's going to be relayed to different locations, all right, of the cerebrum, okay, all right. All right, so how, hypothalamus, okay, so it's under the thalamus, so it's important for the autonomic nervous system, um, regulates body temperature, water balance, regulates metabolism, houses the limbic system for emotions, regulates the nearby pituitary gland, uh, produces two hormones of its own, um, the ADH, that's going to be involved um, affecting the, the adrenal glands far as water reabsorption, so with ADH, that's going to take part. It's a hormone that's going to um, affect the adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys, okay? The adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys, and it's going to play in a role in how much water it gets secreted excrete, or not, okay? It's going to play a role in water, and oxytocin is going to be a hormone that no, you don't really talk about that much, but it plays an important role um, during childbirth. Okay, it's gonna um, play a role far as strengthening the labor contraction contractions. All right, so the epithalamus forms the roof of the third ventricle, houses the pineal gland. I'm sorry, the pineal body which is an endocrine gland, and again, the pineal blood body is going to um, secrete melatonin, which is important for sleep patterns, and it includes the cord choroid plexus, okay, um, the choroid plexus is responsible for producing cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles of the, of the brain, so essentially the choroid plexus or modified epidemal cells. Remember from our other lecture, epidemal cells, um, they make the epithelial cells that line the, the ventricles of the brain. Okay. All right. So essentially these, the choroid plexus is just modified um, epithelial cells. Okay. Modified epithelial cells. Okay. That produce cerebral spinal fluid. And it does that and they're going to be located um, in the ventricles of the brain. You're only, only going to find the choroid plexus, okay, and the ventricles of the brain, all right, and it's going to produce the cerebral spinal fluid. Again, they're just modified epidemal cells. All right, so you have the brain stem, so you have the midbrain, Pons and medulla, okay? And then after the medulla, you're going to have your spinal cord, okay? All right, so right here we have the pons right here. It's circled, remember? Pay attention to what's circled in red. Pons, the medulla, all right? And then the spinal cord, all right? And then you have your midbrain, okay? So your midbrain is going to um, be above the pons, all right? So you see right here the cerebral aqueduct, okay? So the cerebral aqueduct is just going to be a channel where the, for the, um, cerebral spinal fluid to flow, okay, and that's part of the midbrain. And then you also have the corpora quadrigemina, okay, so the corpora quadrigemina, it consists of the superior and inferior colliculus, okay, your superior and inferior colliculus and essentially the corpora quadrigemina are responsible for um there are reflex center in involving vision and hearing okay so your superior and inferior colliculus are reflex centers 
involving vision and hearing. Okay, so this slide talks about the midbrain. So it's mostly composed of tracts of nerve fibers, has the um, two bulging fiber tracts, the cerebral peduncles. So your um, cerebral peduncles are going to essentially have, again, the um, two bulging fiber tracts. Okay, so it's going to be having your ascending sensory information going up, a track for that, and also a descending motor um, nerve track, okay? All right, so it's gonna be ascending sensory and then also a descending motor nerve track, all right? And then the corpora quadrig, um, quadrigemina, again, those are your um, superior and inferior colliculi, um, colliculus, and they are going to be your reflex centers for vision and hearing. All right, so the pons, so the underneath the midbrain, okay, you're going to have your pons, so all of this is midbrain, and underneath that, you have your pons right here all right so the pons is the bulging center part of the brainstem composed mostly of fiber tracts and it's a pathway between the cerebrum and cerebellum and includes nu nuclei involved in the control of breathing okay so it has nuclei and the pawns that are involved in the control of breathing. And you're gonna also, when we talk about the medulla, um, you can also hear more about breathing. So the medulla also has, um, controls the breathing also works with the pawns in that aspect. Okay, so again, it's mostly composed of fiber tracks. So whenever you hear the word fiber tracks, think of information coming and going. Okay, that's just what that is. So it's a pathway between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Okay, and then it also has nuclei involved in breathing, controlling breathing. All right, medulla oblongata. So that's the lowest part of the brainstem. It's going to merge into the spinal cord. And includes the poor and fiber tracts, so pathways between higher brain and the spinal cord, and it controls a lot of things. Okay, you got your heart rate, um, your blood pressure regulation, breathing, um, your swallowing and vomiting. Okay, all that is in the medulla oblongata. So that's a lot of stuff going on for the medulla. All right, so you have your cerebellum, okay? So consists of two hemispheres with convoluted surfaces. All right, so the cerebellum is going to be important for involuntary coordination of body movements, okay? Involuntary coordination of body movements, all right? Um, and you also have um, a distinct tree light pattern um, in the cerebellum white matter. You have the arbor vitae, okay? Um, and if you will look on the slide, on the next slide, so you see right here the arbor vitae and that name is Latin, which translates to the tree of life. And if you look at how this white matter, it does, how you see how it spreads into the cerebellum, it does look like a tree, okay? The way it looks like those are the branches, and then the gray matter kind of looks like leaves of the tree, okay? And the white matter would be, that would be the, 
you know, the the stem, and then these will be like maybe branches, and then the gray matter kind of looks like they could be leaves, but it does look like a tree, okay? Um, but essentially, the arbor vitae plays a, a very important role. So it's going to bring sensory and motor information to the cerebellum, okay? So the arbor vitae is going to bring sensory and motor information to the cerebellum. All right, so the cognitive function of the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is going to recognize and predict sequences of events during complex movements, plays a role in non-motor functions such as word association and puzzle solving. Okay, so these are all, these are cognitive. So when you hear the word cognitive, um, I always think of, things that involve thinking, okay? Um, so, again, um, the cerebellum plays a, a very important role in coordinating body movements, but it also um, plays a role in non-motor functions such as word association and puzzle solving, okay? And those will be cognitive functions. All right, so higher mental functions, memory, which I'm sure all of you are working, you're um, working to get anything in your short-term memory to commit to your long-term um, memory while you're studying. And there are certain ways that you can do that, which we'll talk about on the next slide. But essentially, your um, your brain has um, two stages of storage. So it's short-term memory or your working memory is going to tempor temporarily hold information limited to seven or eight pieces of information. And then your long-term memory has limitless capacity. So the question you may ask yourself, how do you get all of these facts and structures and images and anatomy that you are learning that you need to know for your final from your short term memory to your long term memory? All right. So you have factors that affect transfer from short term memory to long term memory, um, emotional state. Um, so we always remember things while we're emotional better. OK. Um, so, you know, best if alert, motivated, surprised and aroused. So depending on your emotional state, okay, um, we re rehearsal. So rehearsing things, all right, repetition and practice, um, different ways that you can study, like, right, taking notes is one way, um, hearing information, seeing information, okay, um, then, then, you know, discussing it with other people, all those are ways of rehearsing information. Association, so tying something, something new with old memories, that helps. That's why a lot of times um, you use those mnemonics, um, things of that nature, because you're tying new information with old memories, okay? Association, and then automatic memory, subconscious information um, stored in your long-term memory. All right, so categories of memory, you have declarative memory, which is factual knowledge. Um, it's explicit information related to our conscious thoughts and our language ability stored in long-term memory with context in which it was learned. All right, so you have non-declarative memory, less conscious or unconscious acquired through experience and repetition, um, best remembered by doing, hard to unlearn, includes procedural memory, motor memory, and emotional memory. All right, so um, protection of the central nervous system. Um, so you have 
your scalp and skin, the skull, okay, the bones of a T-bro column, all right, the meningen, which is um, three co connected tissue membranes, your cerebrospinal fluid, okay, and then also your blood-brain barrier, which we mentioned in the last lecture. All right, so again, focus on the items in red. You have skin of the scalp, okay, bone right here of the skull, and then you have your dura matter, okay? So the dura matter has two layers, okay, has two layers, periosteo layer, all right, which serves as the skull's inner periosteum and then it has a deep layer okay um meningeal meningeal layer all right the meningeal layer is going to be the dense fibrous layer that covers the actual brain and spinal cord okay so the peri the periosteo layer is superficial okay it's going to be above and the meningeal layer is deep and it's going to be the layer that actually covers the brain and spinal cord you see right here the periosteal layer is right under the skull right under the bone of the skull right under the bone of the skull you got the periosteal layer and then deep to the periosteal layer you have the meningeal layer okay and that's going to be covering the brain and spinal cord all right so um this just goes into more detail what we are got through talking about so the dura matter so this is just going talking about the dura matter which we talked about on the previous slide. All right, so dura matter is a tough outermost layer, um, double layered external covering. You have the periost periosteal layer, which is attached to the inner skull, and the meningeal layer, which is the outer covering of the brain. Folds inward in several areas to limit excess movement of the brain. So you have the false cerebri, okay? So these are, is it's a meningeal enfolding that dips into the longitudinal fissure. And then you have the tentorium cerebelli, which is an enfolding of the meningeal um, layer that extends to the transverse fissure, okay? So I don't know if I said it before, but essentially the meningens, okay, is composed of three membrane layers. All right, the dura matter, which we got through talking about. So the meningens is the dura matter, and then also the arachnoid um, layer, and also the pia um, matter. Okay, so the meningens is composed of those three membrane layers okay and it essentially purpose of the meninges meninges is to protect the central nervous system all right so the arachnoid layer is the middle layer and its web like extension span the subarachnoid space arachnoid villi, vill, villi reabsorb cerebrospinal fluid and then you have the pia matter the internal layer clings to the surface of the brain on the next slide, we'll see um, an image. All right, so we can see the arachnoid matter over the medulla right here. See how that's kind of web-like looking material. All right, that's arachnoid matter.
All right, so the cerebrospinal fluid, um, similar to blood plasma com composition formed by the choroid plexus. Um, the choroid plexus, uh, capillaries in the ventricles of the brain. Um, and remember, we thought about the choroid plexus. It's just um, specialized epidem epidemal cells. Okay. Um, forms a watery cushion to protect the brain. And it circulates in the arachnoid space, ventricles, and central canal of the spinal cord. So in the choroid plexus, the cerebrospinal fluid is going to be formed as the plasma is filtered from the blood through the epithelial cells, okay? Okay, so here's a left lateral view of the brain. So you can see the lateral ventricle. Again, ventricles are where you're going to find your cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, posterior horn, inferior horn, anterior horn, your third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct. Again, that's what cerebrospinal fluid is going to flow also. Fourth ventricle, again, cerebrospinal fluid is going to flow. Um, and then the central canal, you also have cerebral spinal fluid in the central canal. All right, so this is showing you the cerebral spinal fluid circulation. So it goes in steps. So you see step number one, um, cerebral. And it's also, you have the numbers, that's number one. Then you have the writing right there that corresponds with the number. So at step number one, cerebral spinal fluid is produced by the choroid plexus of each ventricle. Step number two, which is right here, cerebral spinal fluid flows through the ventricles and into the subarachnoid space via the median and lateral apert apertures. Some cerebral spinal fluid flows through the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay. Step number three, which is right here, the cerebral spinal fluid flows through the subarachnoid space. And then step number four, which is right here, the cerebral spinal fluid is absorbed in the dural venous sinuses via the arachnoid villi. So now we're going to talk about some pathology. Okay, so hydrocephalus in a newborn. Um, hydrocephalus literally means um, water on the brain. So cerebrospinal fluid accumulates and exerts pressure on the brain if not allowed to drain. So it's not able to drain. So possible in an infant because the skull bones have not yet fused in adults. This situation results in brain damage treated by inserting a shunt into the ventricles to drain the excess fluid. And we're going to see a picture of it on the next slide. All right, that's hydrocephalus, water on the brain. All right, so the blood-brain barrier. So we talked about that before. Um, so it includes the least permeable capillaries of the body. So, um, so remember, we talked about how the astrocytes, um, along with the epidemal cells, which are which essentially are the specialized your epithelial cells or what makes your epithelial cells okay in that area um so the astrocytes the epithelial cells along with the um capillaries which are the least permeable capillaries of the body all take part to form the the blood brain barrier so it excludes many potential potentially harmful substances so um they cannot diffuse through the endothelial 
cell membranes, okay? So they can't get past those endothelial cell membranes, those specialized epidermal cells, okay? Um, and you also have the astrocytes also um, not letting a lot of chemicals through too, okay? Um, and then the capillaries aren't very permeable either. So all those factors contribute to the blood-brain barrier and um, which is important because essentially your brain is arguably the most important organ in your body. So you don't want it to be exposed um, to harmful substances. Okay. Um, but some things, okay, it, it, it doesn't have any effect against. Okay. So um, fats and fat soluble molecules, um, Gases, respiratory gas. I mean, you would want your respiratory gases to be able to diffuse um, through um, alcohol, nicotine, um, medicines that they use for anesthesia. All right, so all those things can easily diffuse um, through the cell membranes. Okay, so some things. So, but still. Um, it does stop a lot of things, okay? So, and even when you want certain drugs to treat the brain, right? Like a lot of times we take drugs for our body, as far as the heart, um, you know, other organs in our body, which we just have to ingest and it's going to circulate through. But a lot of times when you want to design a drug specifically for the brain, you have to... Um, Keep all these things in mind, okay? And you have to design a drug that can cross the blood-brain barrier. All right, so a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident um, results from a ruptured blood vessel supplying a region of the brain. So again, they learned a lot about the functions of the brain actually from strokes. Um, so brain tissue supplied with oxygen from that blood source dies so that area which was depending on that blood source is no longer going to have its oxygen supply so it's going to die and then you can see loss of function or death may result okay and you see a lot of one-sided paralysis that's how they determine you know um the right side of the brain you know deals with the left side motor function and stuff like that um aphasias um ability to speak a lot of times people after people have a stroke they can't speak um, properly on uh, one side of their body may be paralyzed um trans trans ischemia attack is a temporary brain ischemia so restriction of blood of uh, blood flow it's usually a tia is usually a warning sign for a uh, more serious cerebral vascular accident to come um, and a lot of times they, you know, they tell you what to look for when people's having a stroke, um, look for slurred speech, um, their face may be, um, um, drooping on one side. So there's certain things you look for when a person, you think a person is having a stroke. Okay. All right. So the spinal cord. All right, so location begins at the foramen magnum, and it ends at um, L1 vertebra. So the function provides two-way communication to and from the brain and contains the spinal reflex centers, and you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord. Okay, so you see the... Um, Spinal cord here, and then you see the coming off of the sp um, sp spinal cord. You see the spinal nerves, okay, coming off of the spinal cord. All right, so cervical spinal nerves, thoracic spinal nerves. So, um, L1. So essentially, the spinal cord ends at around L1, okay, so L1, so this T12. L1 is right around here. 
So that's where the spinal um, cord ends. A lot of times when they give you those injections in your back, they do it below L1 um, and purposely so that they won't hit your um, spinal cord. So they do it below L1 whenever they give you those back injections. Um, they do it below L1. And you see right here, you have your quarter equina. Um, and your quarter equina translates to horsetail. So if you look at the quarter equina, it does actually look like a horsetail. Um, essentially, it's the um, spinal nerve roots, rootlets, okay? That's what these are, the spinal nerve rootlets, all right? Um, and it looks, does look like a horsetail, okay? It's a quarter equina. So the spinal cord, um, again, um, you don't want your spinal cord to get damaged. If you damage your spinal cord, remember we talked about neural tissue. It doesn't regenerate itself. So uh, once it's damaged, it's damaged. And you can't, um, right at this moment, there's no way to um, undo it. So bones protect your spinal cord. Um, the vertebrae, the meningins protect it, cerebrospinal fluid, protect it. So cushions of fat in the network of veins in the epidural space between the vertebrae and spinal dura matter, um, the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. Okay, so those are all ways to protect your spinal cord. All right, so this is showing you um, a cross section of a spinal cord and vertebrae. So this is the body of the vertebrae, okay? And I'm sorry, some of the writing is writing on top of itself. Um, but you can see the opening of the vertebrae is where you find the spinal cord, okay? Um, the pia matter, it's going to be right on top of it, all right? Pia matter is going to cling to it. And then above the pia matter, you will have the arachnoid matter. And above the arachnoid matter, you will have the dura matter. Okay, the dura matter matter is the outermost part of the meningins. Okay, so outermost part of the meningins is the dura matter. The middle layer is arachnoid matter. And then the layer that clings to the spinal cord and to the brain is the pia matter. All right, and then you see right here the arachnoid matter, okay? And then you see right here below the arachnoid matter is the subarachnoid space, okay? And the subarachnoid space is going to contain the um, cerebral spinal fluid, okay? So this subarachnoid space, which is between the arachnoid and pia matter. It contains the cerebrospinal fluid. And remember, a ganglia is just a, um, so this is a dorsal root ganglia. Ganglia is just a collection of Um, collection of neuron cell bodies. Okay, so um, ganglia are collection of neuron cell bodies. All right, so meningins cover the spinal cord. Um, spinal nerves leave at the level of each vertebrae. So you have the dorsal root associated with the dorsal root ganglia, collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system. So again, the dorsal root ganglia collection, it's a collection of neuron cell bodies, okay, outside the central nervous system. And then you have the ventral root, which contains the axons. Remember the axons is the part of the neuron that's where the information is leaving the, the cell body 
and it's going um, to another, um, it is transmitting the signal to another location, okay? So dorsal roots has the cell bodies, neuron cell bodies, the ventral roots has the axons, okay? Okay, um, and unfortunately, this slide has some writing that's writing over each other. Okay, but here we got the dorsal roots right here. Remember that has the um, neuron cell bodies, dorsal root right here. We have the ventral root right here, which has the axon, okay, axons. We have right here the ventral median fissure. So remember, the fissure is just a deeper suck, suck, sulcus. Okay, so remember, sulcus aren't that deep. Fissures are deeper. Okay, ventral median fissure right there. This is the dorsal median sulcus. Um, this is the gray commissure. Okay, so a commissure is just a meeting place of two bodies. Commissure, that's all a commissure is, meeting place of two bodies. That's the gray commissure. And then, far as the, far as the gray matter, okay, you have the dorsal horn, and then you have the ventral horn. Dorsal means back, ventral means front, okay? Dorsal, ventral, back, front. And that's part of the gray matter, okay? Dorsal, which is back, and ventral, front, horn of the gray matter. Um... All right, so the white columns is just the white matter of the spinal cord. And you're going to, and again, I'm sorry, this is written on top of yourself, so you can't really read it. But you should, you're going to have the interior um, white column. You will have a lateral white column, and you have a posterior white column. And I'm sorry, yeah, you really can't read that. Okay, and that's the end of the lecture.